Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 237, recorded on April 20th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. And we start with something going down in NVIDIA town. Another week and another code drop for review. This latest 13,000 lines of kernel driver code are responsible for the direct rendering manager in NVIDIA's Deep Learning Accelerator. You may have also heard to it referred as NVDLA. And a few years back, in 2017, NVIDIA made the announcement that suggested some deep learning hardware would have an open source driver component sometime in the future. Well, the future is now. At least, we hope. There's also, we should say, an open source user mode driver that interfaces with this new kernel driver, including some stuff around the compiler and runtime code. This latest dump is out for review right now, and if that goes well, it could clear the way for the NVDLA stack to be at least considered for mainline kernel adoption sometime down the line. Right, and then we'd be looking at an open source driver from NVIDIA in the kernel, an open source user space driver as well. And one wants to believe maybe NVIDIA is building towards something here, establishing new relationships and doing things differently, laying some kind of groundwork for maybe an open source driver for the rest of their hardware. But I think the other way to look at this is NVIDIA is really just kind of doing the bare minimum to create a competitive developer focused product in 2022. And they probably should have had this thing out in 2019. I, I mean, I, it could be that, or it could be that we are seeing a change in how they approach kernel software development. Only time will tell, but we'll keep our eye on it. Well, since we love talking about kernel-level goodies here on the show, it caught our attention this week that Sony made a rather notable contribution. Yeah, if you're like us and you're wondering, well, okay, I can imagine Sony does a lot of con contributions for like, the PlayStation, but what else does Sony contribute to the Linux kernel? Well, I'm happy to say this week, it's speed, at least for the XFAT file system. Yeah, and a rather impressive 73% improvement at that. What's going on under the hood? Well, previously, before this patch, when an XFAT file system was mounted in its dir-sync mode and then went to go zero out an on-disk cluster, that request would be translated into sector-by-sector Requests, which generated a ton of tiny little requests that really kept the XFAT file system from being able to perform as fast as the hardware would otherwise allow, basically just getting bogged down with bookkeeping. But after this patch, those requests will instead be submitted all in one big go, which reduces the number of tiny little requests and unlocks the true speed of whatever hardware you might be using. In this case, Sony engineer Yu Zhang Mo tested this out on an ARM platform with a pretty bog standard SD card and found that performance improvements actually started at 73% and went even higher for larger block sizes. Ooh, I love hearing that. And so this patch has been queued this week in the Linux XFAT file system driver development branch. And this performance improvement should land for Linux 519 later this summer. There are some weeks when a free software project just sees a flurry of new development. But unlike commercial software companies that can batch those announcements together and have careful marketing language, praise them on a large stage with fancy graphics and lights, the open and distributed nature of free software, well, it can just mean that some of the best work just flies right under the radar. And I think that might be happening with Plasma. KDE developer Nate Graham came out this week with his KDE development summary, as he does pretty much every week. After reading through it, though, I think it might just be the year of the Wayland desktop. Absolutely, there are so many nice features, fixes, and improvements for Wayland users pretty much throughout everything in the Plasma desktop. Like, even like the Uwake drop-down terminal has one of my favorite fixes. There's some crash fixes at the lock screen. Even inside the task manager, the way things display for processes running on Wayland or X11 or X Wayland now look better. The way virtual desktops are handled. I mean, on and on, you guys. If you run Wayland, you're getting a fix. You're getting a fix. Everyone gets a Wayland fix. 
Yeah, no kidding. There are a ton of fixes all over the place, even outside of Wayland. The list, it's long. But one bug fix that caught my particular attention? KDE apps that are capable of opening PSD files no longer crash when opening a malformed image. Super random, yes, but that's the kind of polish that's just really nice to see, especially since PSD files come from all kinds of sources and still show up way more than I'd like. I just ended up getting sent one earlier this week, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, all right, I think I can do this. We'll have a link to Nate's full post so you can read through this, and you can expect these improvements to trickle into the next few releases of Plasma. But zooming out and looking at the free desktops, major desktop players now, with GNOME 42 landing in everyone's hands in Fedora 36 and Ubuntu 2204, which are shipping just in a matter of days as we record this, both of those distros are using Wayland by default, even in Fedora's case with the NVIDIA driver. And he just put it all together. It's like we were kind of joking, but maybe a little more serious than joking. It does indeed feel like the year of the Wayland desktop. With Ubuntu and Fedora shipping it as default, with Plasma and the GNOME project working so hard to make it work as smooth to the point now where it often works and performs better than it does on X, well, it's like the transition is really here now. We've been talking about it for a decade, but it's real now and it's happening at scale and it's only going to accelerate from here. A very observant Pharonix reader noted a newly started experiment to give Google Chrome a cute backend. Yeah, I know. It's very early days, and to be honest, there's a whole bunch of things here that indicate that maybe it's just a proof of concept. Flags like, do not land, or work in progress labels everywhere. But it does make you wonder, what is Google's interest in using Qt? Honestly, I'm not quite sure right now, but I'd love to hear your best guesses. Send us a boost. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. Linode offers options for developers, users, and businesses that don't want the complexities of the hyperscalers, and you don't need all of their endless options. You want something that covers everything, does what it focuses on, right? That's Linode. That's how we run everything for the last few years. And like us, Linode loves Linux. They use it every day in their environment, in their production, in their tools. It's why they built Linode almost 19 years ago. And now they are the developer's cloud. You want to build a project? Go to Linode. You want to learn something? Go to Linode. And customer support over there is the best. And on top of that, they have the best performance, benchmarked by independent providers. And they have 11 data centers for you to choose from. They have great features like object storage, cloud firewall, fantastic backups, and much, much more. They got an API. It'll be so easy for you to build tooling around. You'll be surprised you never tried it. And I mean it. I'm not like Mr. Developer over here. And I can make it work. It's pretty great. So go build something. Go learn something. Go try it for yourself and support the show. See why it's so great. See why it's one of the remaining standing champions. Linode.com slash LAN. Get $100 in 60-day credit and kick the tires for yourself. Look, they've survived against the big tech monopolies this long. They must be doing something right. Go see what it is and get $100 to try it yourself. Linode.com slash LAN. And a big thank you to Ting. Linux.ting.com. If you're sick of overpaying for your cell service, go see how much you could save. And get $25 off of that, partner. Yeah, I just got a little Southwest there because Ting is so great. I'll put a cowboy hat on to celebrate it. I don't know why, but that's what I feel like. I've been a customer since 2013, and I can tell you wholeheartedly, it's the smarter way to do mobile. It's the way they'd have to do it today. But since we have the environment we have, Ting's like a next generation ninja network. They're a mobile virtual network operator that rides on top of the big duopolies nationwide network. Shore-to-shore -shore coverage with Ting, but you pay their fantastic, great prices, and you get their best customer support. Ting was just recently named the number one carrier by Consumer Reports in 2021. They have plans for those of you who are super price savvy, and they have plans for those of you who've got a lot of work to get done. And it's simple to switch to Ting. 
Pretty much any phone's going to work, and there's no contracts ever. So just head to linux.ting.com. Check your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. Ting will send you a SIM card. You're going to pop that thing in. You'll get activated in minutes, and you'll think to yourself, why didn't I start saving money sooner? There's never been a better time to start saving money on those monthly costs. And Ting's a great way to do it because you get access to those same networks. You just get Ting's great prices. Linux.ting.com Midway through the Fedora 36 development cycle, a proposal was submitted for the next release of Fedora 37 to deprecate legacy BIOS support, which would make Fedora a UEFI-only operating system, at least on x86. And as Michael Arbel over at Pharonix noticed, this really seemed to kick the proverbial hornet's nest, with many Fedora users coming out of the woodwork to express their concern at this idea. Yeah, you can imagine, um, if you've been around the Linux community for a while, this kicks off robust conversation, not just on the official mailing list, but all around Fedora in the wider community, including even, you know, in our channels with our community. And project lead Matthew Miller noted that they've gotten 300 plus messages in that thread in just one week. And within that time frame, they had 66 different participants. And he noted that that handily beaded discussions around systemd resolve D, ButterFS by default, and even the big switch to Nano as the default editor. And it seemed like in the thread that many were adamant for Fedora to keep the legacy bio support and seemed like a lot of them were critical of what they felt was Red Hat clearly looking to reduce their support burden and just have the simplicity of focusing on hardware released in the past decade. So it seems like what might happen is rather than gutting out legacy BIOS support right away, it may lead to the creation of a new Fedora Special Interest Group, or SIG, that would be tasked with maintaining and testing future Fedora releases with legacy BIOS compatibility. Honestly, that might be the best happy middle ground right now. I can certainly appreciate why people still want legacy BIOS support, especially in the open source and free software world, and especially for Linux operating systems in particular, which, I mean, over the years, how many stories have we heard on, on the network about folks that, you know, their original operating system dropped support, but good old Linux still made it work. Right. As you say, though, Chris, we got to balance this because there are real maintenance considerations and Fedora's got something of a reputation these days as pushing the leading edge, which I'm not sure you can really call legacy BIOS anymore. Okay, that's fair. And you, ha- you also kind of have to wonder, like, is uh, Fedora uniquely positioned in this architecture where they have these special interest groups where dedicated members who are interested in something can dedicate their resources, their time, their talent without putting undue burden on the primary project team? That does seem like a pretty good middle ground. It seems like a way to kind of measure interest over the long term as well. But it really, really just touches on a core issue in our community that comes up in various iterations again and again. Another iteration of this is dropping 32-bit support and going with a 64-bit only distro. And it's that same kind of divide that is a divide in how people perceive free software should be made available. And it's a divide in the value that people place on hardware and what is reasonable in maintaining hardware support. And it's like people have very strong feelings and opinions on these things, and it comes together in these sorts of issues. And I think the other thing that stands out to me, Wes, and I'm curious to know your take on this, is I feel like the argument that, well, there's lots of distros to choose from, so just run a different distro that still has bio support, that, that sort of works. But in my opinion, it kind of falls down because we all know the reality is the further you go from a mainstream distro, the more challenging you're going to have, especially as maybe a user who's not super proficient. And so we're basically saying, well, you're going to just have to go live on Niche Island. Yeah, I do think there is that aspect. You know, it comes and goes and what exactly you consider niche, you know, may vary. So it might be that just moving over and sticking on something like Debian could, could keep you happy here for quite some time because, you know, they've, they've kind of got a different approach to some of these issues. But you're right, you know, maybe Debian's not the operating system you want to use. Or, let's own up a little here, we're, we're pushing Fedora pretty hard these days, right? Because they're doing a lot of neat new stuff that we like, we find useful, we want to play with. And if you're suddenly told, well, there's this one thing about your hardware, which means, nope, sorry, 
you, you just don't have access to that. And there is the reality that the longer we can get life out of older hardware, the more sustainable that makes this equipment, the better it is for the entire world. And so there's that like very strong argument too. And there is the absolutely unavoidable reality that we have limited developer time and limited developer focus that can go towards these projects. And we have to treat that like a precious commodity as well. And so these seem to me like very hard problems to solve. And Fedora sort of seems like the ideal place to sort this out because they are seen as a leading edge distribution, because they have these special interest groups that can take some of the burden off of the primary project. And they can develop something here. They can work something out that I think eventually other distributions will learn from. And so it's sort of great that it's starting here with Fedora. I mean, it's not necessarily starting here, but it's going mainstream with Fedora. Yeah, it does seem like it might be a particularly effective way to handle this, just in that, you know, boot support is not entirely, but often components of it are, are limited to sort of getting the operating system booted. And once you've got the regular old kernel running, once you're in user space, you got your desktop, maybe the changes can be minimal versus something like, you know, keeping 32-bit support around, which involves a lot more recompilation. You know, in this world, that might just mean that the folks who are interested in keeping the support alive, well, they'd have to deal with some of the bug reports coming in. They'd have to do testing for upcoming releases and verify that legacy BIOS support works. But, you know, Grub supports both. So if you can just keep Grub going and allow those extra options, maybe it's a couple additional packages with a couple different defaults, that seems like it might work at least for as long as those with BIOS still need it. There is a lot in Fedora 36 under the hood and for the desktop, and it's coming out in just a matter of days, currently aiming for an April 26, 2022 release. Go check out Linux Unplugged episode 454 for our rundown and all the new stuff in there. And of course, as we record now, Ubuntu 2204 is scheduled to release tomorrow. We also covered that in Linux Unplugged 454, and that is an LTS release. So there's a lot to discuss there as well. But that does bring us to the end of this week's broadcast. So go get every episode of Linux Action News by going to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get every episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know how upset about the BIOS removal you really are. And get your message and your feedback to the front of the line. Send us a boost with a new podcast app, newpodcastapps.com. We'll see you right back here next week for our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.